Okay, today is Monday, 8, April 8, 2024. And just a reminder, right? Let's take a look at this syllabus. We are writing here, April 8, 2024. And I'm planning to finish electromagnetic induction and AC circuits. Let's not forget that we have an exam this Wednesday. Okay, chapters 20 and 21. We are covering chapters 22, chapter 22. We hopefully, hopefully we're gonna finish it today and then we're gonna start at chapter 23. So let's take a look at the material exam. Let's see, exam. Exam two, next, uh, uh, exam two, next Wednesday, April 10th, 24. And the material for the exam, we were ready, I have ready. Posted it before, let me just repeat it right now, right here. Material for exam two. Right here, material for exam two. Okay, this one is gonna be part of exam three, right? Although it's part of uh, chapter 20, but we needed electromagnetic induction. We, need, we needed to cover electromagnetic induction so you can, you could understand how we generate uh, an alternating circuit. That's why we are leaving it for a later exam. That's why I initially skipped that and we're leaving that for a later exam. Okay. And that's chapter 21, labs one and two, related notes and videos. And Regarding report for lab three, uh, I haven't corrected. I haven't corrected because I noticed many of you are failing to many of the reports. Let's put that many of the reports, many of the reports do not have the significant figures, right? And I want to give you, I want to give you all an opportunity to fix that. Otherwise you're gonna get a low grade, right? Otherwise you all, you get, you will get a lower grade. I do not know if that applies to you two that joined us, but uh, two of the, out of the three groups, they turn in a lab report that didn't have the significant figures in there. So instead of correcting the lab report and giving you know and giving you a lower grade, uh, I decided to to give you another chance and turn in the lab three. Uh, two weeks from uh, lab three and hopefully lab four, right? Two weeks from now. So, so you may turn uh, the reports for labs three, four, and five. Did you call me five here? We cover lab five, yes. Next week, not two weeks from now, but uh, next week, we're talking about April 17th. And for on April 17th. Okay, when more students arrive, uh, I'm gonna go back to that. And then what are we 
continue to cover today, okay? So we're going to elaborate a little bit more on Faraday's equation. Today, you know, we will elaborate a little bit more on Faraday's equation. Faraday's equation is that equation that relates the Electromotive, they use the electromotive force or the induced voltage or the induced current, okay? Right here. We're going to write Faraday's equation in a slightly different way. We will write the both equation in a slightly different way that will allow us to define a term, to define two different terms that are very useful. Oh, two students. Two different terms. Uh, parameters, not two different terms, but two different parameters that are very useful. The mutual inductance, the mutual inductance, which we denote by the letter M, capital M, and the cell inductance, which we denote by the letter L, okay? For those students who just arrived, okay? Let me just go quickly what I covered so far. Exam two is the day after tomorrow, Wednesday. Okay. The material for exam two is chapters 20 and 21. We are excluding 20.5 from this exam, which will show up in exam three. There is a reason for that. The reason is that alternating circuit is best introduced after, after we deal with induced current, after we deal with Faraday's law of induction. Faraday's law of induction is what ends up generating an alternate, uh, is what we use to, to generate an alternating circuit. Okay, that's why I skipped it, initially skipped that, and uh, I'm going to introduce that to you after we finish chapter 21. Okay, after we finish chapter 22, right? For the exam is chapter 20 and 21 plus labs one and two, related notes and videos. And I'm going to repeat here. Uh, report for lab three. I didn't correct report for lab three. I did not correct. I did not correct the report for lab three because I know, see, most of you did not uh, work on the significant digits, significant figures in the lab report. And I want to give you the opportunity to fix that, okay? To fix that, otherwise you get a lower grade. So you may turn turn the reports for labs three, four, and five on 17th of April, Wednesday next week. And now going back to the material, mutual inductance and self-inductance, okay? So there, there are some special circumstances in which we can apply Faraday's equation to come up with something that we call the mutual inductance and the self-inductance. So we start with this equation for the circuit, okay? And we apply, we consider, you know, 
Using this equation here, we will be able to define two different parameters that are very useful. The two parameters are called mutual inductance and the self-inductance. Mutual inductance M and self-inductance L. Okay? So it's just another way. This is just what we're going to do. is just another way of writing. Here you go. What we are going to do, going to do is just another way of writing Faraday's law of induction, which allow us to define the above parameters. Above parameters. Okay, so what do we do? When we're dealing with mutual inductance, we have to have at least two solenoids. When we're dealing, okay, one that's connected to a generator, Okay, and another one, a second one that's a closed circuit that has no power source whatsoever. It's going to be something like that. Let me get that for you. Not this one, I gotta go down. I was going the wrong direction, here you go. Right in here. Do you see that? We have the solenoids, the black wires, connected here to a generator. That's the symbol of a generator. A circle with a tilde inside, the sinusoidal. Uh, the tilde represents the sinusoidal wave. This is, the tilde represents the sinusoidal current or the sinusoidal voltage generated by the generator, right? The generator that's rotating in a magnetic field. And then we have a second solenoid here inside the first one. The second solenoid has those wires that have a red, red color. Okay? So when we have a current that changes in time, like we have here in this primary solenoid, it will induce a current in the second solenoid, right? It will induce, because the current here is changing time, because the current in the first solenoid is changing time, it, it, it also creating a magnetic field that changes in time. And that magnetic field that changes in time is inducing a current in the second solenoid. That's the experimental setup that you have to have in mind. Okay, so here you go. This uh, a second solenoid has a length L prime in, in prime terms. Here you go, this one here, the primary solenoid has a length L with N turns. Okay, so here you go. Uh, one that's connected to a generator, the generator. This one is the primary, the primary coil or the primary circuit. And a second one with a core closed circuit, no power whatsoever. The secondary coil or the secondary circuit. Okay. The first, the primary coil has and P turns, and the secondary coil has what? N F turns, N P and N S. Okay, let's not forget, let us not forget that the primary coil is connected to a generator that is providing with a voltage, with the following voltage, Following voltage, OK? 
Ok, here you go. Voltage do to the voltage in the primary coil. That's the P stands for the primary coil. Changes in time according to a voltage to a peak voltage times sine of omega t. Okay. So the primary coil has a, a resistance. Everything has a resistance, right? And because of that, we can use Ohm's law to find out the current in the primary coil. I'm even going to put a resistance of the primary coil here, R sub P, okay? We did calculate before, recall, recall that we, that before, we found that the magnetic field, magnetic field inside a solenoid is uniform and given by, remember that? Well, it's, it's a, I'm gonna put like that, you know, that what we found that the magnetic field in the solenoid was given by, right? I'm gonna put a B is directly proportional to the current, right? Here, what you have here is the number of uh, turns per unit of length, and that's the unit here, okay? So when we connect, when we have a current that changes in time, we are going to have a similar magnetic field inside. Uh, inside the solenoid with a current, a variable current, a current that changes in time is also associated, is also associated, yeah, let's see, also, also generates a magnet, a B field that changes in time uh, since we are delaying with a solenoid, right? The relation is this one here. And let's not forget, I'm gonna go the next step, okay? The next step here is this one that you see. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna use this one so we have a simpler That's the that's the time variation of my magnetic field, my magnetic field of the primary coil. Okay. And it is this magnetic field inside the primary coil that is inducing a current in the secondary circuit or in the secondary coil. Okay. And now we can come back, go back to our, to our Faraday's law, right? And he write the electromotive force induced, the electromotive force EMF induced in the secondary coil will be given by, I'm gonna put it here, induced in the secondary, as for secondary, okay? And by the way, I'm gonna simplify the notation. Okay, I'm gonna remove this open surface. And I'm going to emphasize that what we have here is going to be the magnetic flux through the primary coil. Okay, I'm emphasizing here that the induced electromotive force of the secondary coil. And, you know, I'm gonna do something else too. I'm gonna say, look, it's the 
flood, the magnetic flux through a single turn of the primary coil. And now I can put this parameter NP here, the number of turns in the primary coil, multiply it by the magnetic flux through a single loop of the primary coil, okay? But, you know, we can also state that uh, this, this equation here is also equal to the number of turns of the secondary coil times the change in magnetic flux in the secondary coil as well. Okay? Does this relationship holds? Because the change in magnetic flux in the first coil is inducing a current in the secondary coil, which, by the way, is generating this magnetic field that we also have a magnetic flux associated with it. And we must have this equality for Faraday's law to hold. Okay, and I'm gonna do something else too. I'm gonna do something else too. I'm, I'm doing that because I want to define the mutual inductance, right? Remember that. I'm going to put this term here inside the equation for the change in flux. I'll put a parenthesis, a parenthesis here, okay? And I will repeat on the other one here. And all I have to do is to change the parameters from P to S. Here you go. I'll change from P to S. Don't forget we have an equality here. And now that we have this equality, I'm going to rewrite it downstairs. OK? We have this equality here. And we can start simplifying this equality. The first simplification is the negative sign. The negative sign cancels out. The next simplification is to realize that whatever is inside this parenthesis must be equal to whatever is inside this parenthesis, right? And then we, here you go. The thing, the thing, okay? And then we can go, we can start uh, working out and I'm, what I'm going to do, you know, don't forget that uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to expand this term now. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to do this way. Like that, okay. So, this term that you see here is a magnetic flux, which is given by the magnetic field of the oh, magnetic field of the primary coil times the area of the primary coil, right? I'm going to emphasize the magnetic field of the primary coil changes in time. And let's not forget that this magnetic field that changes in time is uniform. It's uniform. And because it's uniform, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm just write that down in terms of a proportionality, okay? And let's say the proportionality term, I'm calling this C, C for constant. Magnetic fields are always proportional to the current, right? So that I'm writing down my magnetic fields. You know, it's, you know what the CP term is all about, right? Because I wrote it down before. You go, the CP term is this one right here. Okay? But I'm going to 
simplify it this way. Okay. And then what else? This term here is a, is a, it depends on ge the geometry of our primary inductor. Okay, this one too depends on the geometry of my inductor, and this one as well. Okay, I, I even, I'm gonna write that down like you I wrote before, right? It's gonna in reality is n sub p times uh, mu naught, right? Going back here. Mu naught. And my current in the primary coil is I naught sine of mega t. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to rewrite this equation like that, okay? And look at those terms right here, right? It depends on the geometry of my solenoid, depends on the geometry of my solenoid, it depends on the geometry of my solenoid as, as well. What do you have here is just N sub P capital P divided by L, right? That's what we have here. And we have a, a constant, a physical constant, and and finally, you know, this term here, I am going to call my mutual inductance. It doesn't depend on time. It depends only on the geometric of geometric parameters of my inductor. That's how you define it. And you go. If we here write the same, we're gonna get something like that, like the following. Like that. So that's how we define the mutual inductance. The mutual inductance is going to be given by this ratio that you see right in here. Okay. So if we go back to our to Faraday's law of induction. Let's go back to it right in here. This one here that I want. Faraday's law of induction. One more student coming. Okay, we are going, let me repeat that, this one here. I'm gonna repeat it this way. Okay, what do we have? We have that N sub S times the flux, right? Which can be here written like that. Okay. is going to be a function of the mutual inductance and the current in the circuit. Because the circuit doesn't change shape, doesn't change its geometric configuration as time goes by, we can take this M outside, right? We can take this M outside this parenthesis, and we end up having Faraday's law in a different format, not in terms of the magnetic flux, but in terms of the 
current in the circuit, Faraday's law. There you go. Faraday's law in terms of uh, the current in the circuit. Just another way of uh, rewriting Faraday's law. I'm going to put it side by side. Right here. Put it side by side. Oh, right. I want to put it this way. One more student. That's nice to have more people joining us. Okay. Those two equations are exactly the same. We're getting an I here because the magnetic flux in a solenoid is proportional to the current. Proportional to the magnetic field, which is proportional to the current, right? And now we are you're going to see that there's a very nice progression in terms of the other devices that we worked in the past, okay? I'm gonna write it down here. This is just another way of you writing Faraday's induction law, which by the way, which is a very useful one. Law, induction which is which is a very useful one. Recall how we how is the electric potential across a capacitor? Do you remember that? Capacitance is defined as Q divided by C, right? Remember that? So the voltage across a capacitor is Q divided by C, but we can rewrite that in a slightly different way. We can here write, which is the same, which is, uh, you know, we can here write that as though as my, as I have uh, delta Q in which the delta is raised to the zero power, okay? So this Q that you see right here, I'm going to emphasize in this way, one times Q, right? Whereas this Q, can be here written down in terms of a change in current over change of time, but it's a change that's raised to the zero power, okay? Anything that's raised to the zero power becomes one, right? There's a reason why I'm writing this way. There's a reason why I'm writing this way. And you're going to see why. When we are talking about the resistor, right? When we talked about the resistor, the voltage across the resistor, Ohm's law, even by Ohm's law, is Ri, and I is delta Q over delta T. And I'm going to emphasize that this delta is raised to the first power, and this T is also raised to the first power. Right? I'm emphasizing that. And... So you can see the progression of the voltage for each different device, right? Recall that for the capacitor resistor, and now in vector, we have the following relations. Okay. Like that. And now we have for our inductor that the induced voltage in the second circuit is going to be given by what? You know, it's going to be given by something like that. Here you go, a parameter of the capacitor that depends on its geometrical configuration, a parameter of the resistor that depends on the ge its geometrical configuration, and a parameter of our inductor that depends 
on the geometrical on the parameter of the geometrical configuration. But then we can do something else. We can we can go more. We can go further now. Note see that the current in the primary inductor can also be written in terms of the charge that flows along the inductor, right? Delta Q, P over delta T. And let's see, what else do we have? We have, we're going to rearrange this delta Q, P. Okay, here you go. Delta, delta T, delta Q, P, delta T. And finally, look what, how nice, we have here for all those three devices, right? A term that depends on the geometrical configuration of the capacitor, a term that depends on the geometric configuration of the resistor, a term that de depends on the geometrical configuration of the inductor. And then we have it here, we have a charge here, charge here, and charge here. The only thing that changes is this delta term. The first delta term is delta to the zero power delta to the first power and delta to the second power. Isn't that the nice progression? So if you forget uh, those relations, you can, it's easier to memorize this relationship, right? You go. Okay. And that's for when you have two, two solenoids. We have this mutual inductance term. And I'm going to here out here write, let's see, the mutual inductance term. Let's write it down. I didn't write it down separately, right? Let's write it down separately. It's like that. That's M is all about. That's what M is all about. Okay, I can go even another step. I can write it down as N sub P divided by L, right? And that's what the mutual inductance term looks like. Okay. Like, oh, no, we should use lowercase l so you don't confuse it with another term that they're gonna, that's gonna come, they're gonna show up, okay? That, well, we, we did all of that for mutual inductors. And now, what if we have just one single solenoid, okay? I'm gonna copy everything. Stop, think about that, digest it, okay. We did for mutual inductance, two solenoid. What about consider a single solenoid now? Single solenoid now. Now consider a single solenoid. Now consider a single solenoid. Connected to a generator that generates a sinusoidal current. We are eliminating the second solenoid, and that's not going to be mutual inductance. Now it's going to be self inductance. If the primary, okay, if the primary solenoid generates a current in the second solenoid, okay? Now, when we remove the second solenoid, we can also state that the first solenoid self-induce a current in itself, okay? Now the situation is like that. A single solenoid with n turns, length L, with a current that flows the changes in time, 
is going to create a magnetic field that changes in time here inside. And this magnetic field that changes in time will also induce a current in this circuit. Will self induce a current in this circuit that will counter the change in the current from the generator. Okay? And there is a term associated with that that we call the inductance, self inductance. Let's take a look. It's exactly the same. Uh, the same step that we take. Now we do not have to define primary solenoid anymore, right? Let's not forget that this solenoid, this coil, right? This connector generator that's prov providing the following voltage according to Ohm's law. We don't have uh, to state that now we have a primary coil because we have just a single coil. I don't have to state that we have a primary resistance because we have just a single coil. Remember that the magnetic field of solenoid is given by that, right? There you go. I'm going to remove the subscript P. Okay. And by the way, there I must correct previously here. Yeah, see that? I must put a P, right? Subscript to that. Not here, because we have just a single solenoid. Now, the electromotive force induced uh, in this solenoid, induced in this solenoid, will be given by, now we are talking about self-induction. OK, self-induction is going to be N. I don't need the primary here anymore because I have, and I don't need this relationship here. Okay. And I can elaborate a little bit more. It becomes simpler. Can I go ahead and elaborate a little bit more? Okay, this term is going to become uh, B A. Oh, B A. Right. B A is what. BA is what is mu naught mu naught I we have the I there certainly I'm going to emphasize the fact that this term is a function of T and I'm going to emphasize the fact that this term is a function of T oh don't forget that we also have numbers of turn per unit of length Right, number of turns. Oh, we have it. It's all here. I'm just substitute what you have here, right in here. Okay. The area doesn't change in time. Mu naught and n doesn't change in time. Consequently, they can be taken out from that parenthesis. I'm going to put the area here. I don't need that uh, parenthesis there anymore. Okay. And now what happens? What happens now is that we define this term here as being the term of self-induction. 
Okay. Uh, let's go another step. The N uh, that you see there is capital N divided by lowercase L. The N uh, combined, capital N combines capital N, it becomes N squared. Okay, N squared. Uh, let's see, I'll leave it here. And now everything that you see here, I define as being the term of self-inductance. Okay. Self-inductance L. And I'm going to here write. I don't need that anymore. Like that. That's the term of self inductance. And now we can add one more term to my list, right? Of voltages, which is it going to be? like that, you know, self-induction is going to be L here. And I don't need the P subscript anymore. If N uh, was given by this term, now L is going to be given by this term, let's, we usually put those constants here in front. Okay, and that's what I'm gonna do is this one. It's not much different from the other one. The only thing, the only difference is that I don't have a subscript in there. Okay. So those, those are the two important parameters that we have. I will here write the important relationships that we got in the past for the capacitor. Resistor and inductor, okay. Capacitance, resistance, mutual inductance and inductance. Right. Gonna be like that. And that what is all about for this section, 22.8, mutual inductance. Okay. Now it's helping that. Okay. And then we can start talking about the energy stored in the inductor. That's 9.45 right now. Let's go another five minutes. Energy stored in the inductor. Okay.
Okay, for a capacitor, you're, we already know that relation here. For a capacitor, we have this relationship. For an inductor, we calculate, we can calculate the energy in an inductor by using a similar procedure that we use there for the capacitor. Do you remember what we did there? Okay, so in, for the case of the capacitor, we could increase uh, the, the potential energy. We calculate that we could increase the potential energy, right? According to this relationship here. Uh, for the cap let me put for the capacitor first. Here you go. For the capacitor, we did we did like the following. Uh, Delta U over delta Q was equal to V. Yeah, minus V for the capacitor. And we have the same thing for the inductor. Okay, and we here write. If you write that by passing the Q to the others, the difference between one and the other is that one is, is an induced voltage. The other is not an induced voltage. Okay. But I call, I'm gonna emphasize here the induced voltage. What was, you know, right in here. That's the induced voltage, right? And, but there is more, right? It's not just like that. It's, uh, I'm, I'm will, uh, let's see, I will write here. I want to write down in terms of the current. This term here on the right side is the same as this one, okay? So the induced current mm -hmm. I'm gonna put it parenthesis. Minus, and then we have this delta. Q, right? The negative sign cancels out. This negative sign cancels out with this negative sign. And now we do a little trick here. We pass this delta T. We commute that with the delta Q, right? I don't want to do that. Um, like that. Okay, I commute the delta Q in the delta I. There is the delta Q. And then what we have, we end up having a term that's given by the current. Okay, and I'm going to rearrange it in a different way. I'm gonna put the I in front of. I'm gonna, you know, take away this delta T, this T, because there's no need. Uh, so just to simplify the notation. Okay. Well, it happens that here is just an increment in, in electric potential energy in 
potential energy, okay? And in this case, it would be a magnetic potential energy. Okay, it happens that if I want, if you want to know the total, to find the, the total potential energy, we must use differential calculus. We're not gonna do that here, but I will give you the final answer. If we do that, if we do that, the same thing applies for the capacitor. We have, we have something similar for the capacitor. If we do that, the total potential energy becomes, and I'm going to write it down, the delta I becomes an I, that is going to multiply the other i, okay? But then we must also have a half term that goes there, okay? And that's not the delta u now, it's going to be total u, and by the way, it's going to be magnetic potential energy, okay? In the case of the capacitor, you remember what was the potential energy of a capacitor was C, half of C, V square, right? Oh, C, V square. For the capacitor, we found the following relation, following relation. Okay, half, half. Parameters that depend on the geometrical configuration of the device. Parameter that depend on geometrical configuration of the device. Okay. Here we have a parameter that depends, that's related to the electric field. And here we have a parameter that's related to the magnetic field. Okay. Let us elaborate on the above equation for the potential energy. Okay. Uh, in other, let us let us apply right. Let's apply the relation, the equation for the potential of the potential energy of the potential energy to a solenoid. Okay. What you see right in here doesn't depend on the type of device. Doesn't depend, doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a, a solenoid, if it is some other configuration like a toroid, okay? But if we apply that to a solenoid, we will have the following. We have to use the L for the solenoid that we de derived before. Here you go, this one right here. Okay, mu naught right, and go ahead and elaborate this. Next step. Let's, uh, let's see here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply the upper one and divide by the same. Oh, I'm going to go like that. 
I'm going to multiply this equation by L and divide by L. There's a reason why I'm, why I'm doing that, okay? There's a reason when I do that, I recognize this is a trick similar that we did for the, for the capacitor, right? We end up with a term just like that. And I'm going to emphasize this in the next step. I'm going to emphasize that we have this term length times area of the solenoid. Length times area of the solenoid is nothing but its volume. Okay, which I'm going to denote by lowercase d. And by the way, this term here, we can write down as a lowercase n, which is the density of terms, just to simplify the relationship. Okay, what else? What else? Okay, now we are going, I'm going to simplify right here, like that. I'm going to recall that the magnetic field of a solenoid is given by this relation. Okay. And what else? I'm going to rewrite the current in terms of the magnetic field for the solenoid and substitute right in here. I'm going to, you know, bold face it, bold face it. So you have the connection, right? When we do that, let's see what, what we get. We did something similar for the capacitor, right? Okay, if you, the U, the potential energy of the magnetic field, right? This half of that end, what, what, we, what we did here, we substitute the I by this term right in here. This N here cancels out. Part of this mu naught cancels out. This one, we already know that is a volume, right? Volume. And what else? Well, we do exactly what we did for our capacitor before. We pass the volume to the left side. And then, bingo, we have a relationship that's similar what we found oh, what we found for the capacitor I call this one here the energy density of the magnetic field that's given by half 1 over mu naught right b squared half one over mu naught b squared. No, 959 already. Yeah? Let me finish it here, mu, uh, like that, UB, right? Recall that for the electric field, we had a similar relationship. For the electric field, we had A epsilon naught, and instead of a magnetic field, we had a, an electric field. Okay. So that's it. So if you remember this one, it's going to be rather easy to remember this one. Just recall that it's going to be the inverse of this magnetic constant, not the, not the the direct pro proportion, right? And
one more thing before we go to our break. I didn't tell you about the unit of inductance. Okay, the unit of inductance. The unit of a capacitance is the Faraday. We covered that before. The unit of resistance is the ohm. And the unit of inductance is going to be what we call the Henry. Okay, and how do you obtain that? We will be taking that by just doing our dimensional analysis, inductances related to the flux and the current. Okay, the Henry is given by Tesla meter square by, divided by A. And I want to take attendance right now. Any questions about that? Uh, for those who arrived late today, right? Let me just go back to what I covered before. It's important that I repeat here. We have an exam this the day after tomorrow, Wednesday. That's the material for the exam two. We are not covering this section on the second exam. This, se this, this section here is gonna appear on exam three, okay? And those sections in chapter 21, labs one and two, and related notes and video. Um, by the way, lab three, I did not correct the report for lab three because I noticed that many of the reports did not have significant figures and I want to give you the opportunity to fix that. Otherwise you're gonna get a lower grade, right? I don't see that in lab one and two, you know, most of you didn't uh, work on, on the significant figures on lab one and two, so I, and because of that, you got a lower, uh, a low grade. So I want to give you an opportunity to fix that on lab three, and then you can turn on the reports for lab three, four, and five on 17th of April. Okay, and again, you know that's going to be the the exam the day after tomorrow. Do you need a little bit more more of time? I don't think you need, right? So let's 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 stick to this date for the for the third, second exam, and I will take attendance right now. Roster, April eight. Jacqueline, are you there? Yes. Thank you, Jacqueline. Next is Sky. Are you there? I don't see Sky here in my roster. Next is gonna be Ashley, are you there? Thank you, Ashley. Corina? Thank you, Corina. Norberto Lopez? I don't see Norberto here. Next is gonna be Vanessa Mena. Here. Thank you, Vanessa. Yorgo? Hello, Yorgo, are you there? Okay, I cannot hear you, Yorgo. I'm gonna put a star here in your attendance. If you're there and you can hear me, just type there in the chat box. Lizelle, are you there, Lizelle? Yep, thank you. Next is Paul Zapata. Thank you, Paul. We have uh, seven, good. So 10.05 right now. Professor, my mic wasn't working, I'm here. Okay, good, thank you. I will give attendance. One, and now break. 10.05, 2 a.m., right? 10.20 a.m. Before you go into the break, I'm going, okay, here you go. Chapter 22 so far. We have one more section left for chapter 22 before we get into AC circuits, okay? 
mutual inductance in self. That's, that's the last, will that be the last chapter for the exam Wednesday? No, the, the exam on Wednesday doesn't cover 22, right? Chapter uh, exam on Wednesday, ex second exam is just chapters 20 and 21, okay? Chapter 22 is going to show up in exam three. Make sense? Yes. Okay, okay. Okay, so when you go come back from the break, we talk about transformers. So I see you in 15 minutes. I'm back here. Let's go back here to this to this relation here for the magnet for for the potential energy, right? Here you go. This one, this one here. Okay, up to here, there's no secret, right? The secret is how you turn the magnetic potential energy into, into this relation here, okay? There is a simple way of visualizing this relationship that you, you see here. And let me just put uh, uh, delta U sub B, right? That is a very simple way of seeing how we can convert this relation that you see here into this other relation. What we have here is the following, that as I increase the current by an amount delta I, okay, the potential energy increases by this amount here. That's what this equation is telling us. But I don't want to know the how the potential energy increases with the increasing current. I want to know the total electric po uh, magnetic potential energy. And like I said, there is a very simple way of do of uh, of of figuring out how you come to this relationship. Okay, and the way you do it is the following: we here write this equation. as a ratio between between delta u and delta i like that okay and then what we do we plot this value here against this value okay L is a constant. It doesn't increase, doesn't change with increasing current, okay? And when we do that, let's do that. I'm going to do that for you. And here you go. Here's one axis. Here is another axis. Hey, what am I going to do? I'm going to put along the y-axis. I'm going to put this guy here. Okay. And I'm going to put... along the x-axis, the current i, okay? Notice that there is a linear relationship between those two different parameters. Okay, and what do we get? We get a straight line with a slope, right? With a slope here given by L. 
So we can write that down. By plotting, by plotting. Delta U, uh, delta U, delta I versus I, we get a straight line, straight line with a slope of L, right? Simple enough, right? And that's what we have here. I can... Like that. I'm going to denote the slope as being L. As being L. Then what else? There's more. There is more to that. Okay. If I go ahead and get a very small slice of this plot, okay, and this slice. This is lies has a has a thickness delta i. I'm gonna put it here. Delta i thickness. Delta I sickness and you know this area that you're going to that you have right here is nothing but and I'm gonna put a, one more thing here. I put the uh, dashed. It's nothing but delta U sub B delta I times delta I, right? Which is going to be this area here is going to be delta U sub B, right? So I'm going to fill it with and I'm going to write that down. Like that. And I'm going to put a like that. Okay. Consequently, the total area that you have right in here in this triangle is not going to be delta UB, but it's going to be U sub B. It's going to be the total potential energy. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to put that in my notes so you can follow the thinking. It's nipping to. Okay, so here go.
plotting, you get a straight line, okay, like that, with a slope of L, with a slope of L, to find the, before finding the total potential energy, right? Now, An infinitesimal, infinitesimal, infinitesimal um, rectangle below a rectangle, a rectangle with an infinitesimal side delta i below this line, right? Come As an area delta ub delta u b c below c below that's going to be the next uh, Next, next graph, which I'm going to put in the notes as well. Consequently, the total magnetic potential energy will be given by the area below the straight line. The total magnetic potential energy U sub B will be given by the total area below the straight line, which is going to be what? Uh, half. See here. Oh, here you go below the straight line or or half uh, the side times delta u delta u sub b right over over delta i Okay. And the way we do that is the following you go. Oops. Consequently, the I gotta get this one here. I'm gonna illustrate that for you. This one right in here. No. 
yeah, right, right like that. So it's going to be something like that. This area. Okay, so there you go. I don't need that here. I'll put that right in there. This one here is going to be my current at this spot. This is no longer delta i, right? Half i delta ub, but hey, wait a minute. But delta u sub b time divided by delta i is going to be what? Is this value that you see right in here, right? Make sense? Uh, equal, there's a equal here, li. And we finally have uh, the relationship that I mentioned to you. The same reasoning can be obtained for the capacitor. Okay? And I'm going to copy that right here. But the total magnetic potential will be given by the total area below the straight line or I can even illustrate by the same token that I, I illustrate that uh, or something like that. I'm going to put a different uh, fill up. Yeah, like that. That's going to be half I times okay. like that, which by the way, is going to be L I L I Okay So that's how we prove this final equation here either using differential calculus or using this geometric argument. We must use either differential calculus or geometrical arguments. Okay. And we, we had the same thing for the, for the capacitor. Okay, and now we're going to talk about the transformer. Any questions so far? Okay, just uh, let it percolate your brain. There's lots of information. Sometimes it's not very familiar information, but I try to make it as familiar as possible. Okay.
And now what we have to do, we have to talk about transformers. So what devices we talked so far, we talked about so far, we talked so far, we talked about the following devices. The following devices, right? The capacitor. The resistor. The inductor. But we also discuss the electric motor. We discuss the generator. And now we're going to talk about the transformer. Okay. Transformers are very important devices that are used in our daily lives. You can see them, you can see them uh, in the power lines of the street that you love. And there's no secret for the transformer. If you understand the inductor, if you have a picture of the solenoid, of a solenoid, right? You, you will also have a picture of the transformer. Let's take a look. I think we have a, a picture of a transformer here. Oh yeah, here you go. In the power line, in the power stations, and the power lines too. This thing here looks like a transformer to me. It's too far away, but those are transformers as well. Okay, let's see if we have other pictures here of transformers. Mm -hmm. Okay, step down. Okay, a transformer. So in the poles, we usually have transformers uh, in a given pole, right? We usually have a transformer that converts electricity on, of one voltage to another. That's what we usually see in the streets. And let's go into the internet. Power line transformers. I want to see, I want to show you a picture of a power line transform. Oh, yeah, here you go. Yeah, Professor, yeah. what's crazy is not a lot of people know about this, huh? What, what do you say? Not a lot of people know about this, about the power line, how, how the electricity comes through and everything. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. That's right. But depending depending on the person, right? If you're curious enough, you, you, you get into that, right? You get into that. But here you go. Here's a picture of a transformer and the power lines. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more. And, and that's explained in the book too, okay, Yorgo? That's also explained in the book. Here you go. Uh, why, why this picture is such a... I don't like this picture. Let me go back. Uh, this one here. Here you go. Maybe this one is better. Yeah. See, you have the pole, right? You have the the transmission lines. It's not every pole that has a transformer. And this transformer is here for a reason. Okay? This transformer is here. That we can see in our day-to-day day -day lives. So... So let's say the electricity is coming from the power station from the left, okay? In real life, what do they do? You know, in order to save energy due to losses of the resistor of the line, what do they do? They transmit electrical energy at a very high voltage level. We're talking about 10,000 volts, okay? Which, if you were... If it was used to feed directly into your house, it might be very dangerous for whoever is there at home. So what do they do? They use a transformer to convert high electric potential 
into lower electric potential, let's say from 10,000 volts to 120 volts or to 220, right? That's what we call a step down power, uh, transformer, right? That's what we call a step down transformer. So this okay. transformers, these transformers are making the wattage of the electricity weaker. So not every house sucks in strong electricity. It is, it's not the watts, right? It is the voltage. See that? Power is usually generated about 11,000 volts, right? To, to 25,000 volts. For this power to travel long distances, the voltages are often, in, often increase. Oh, it's 400,000 volts. See that? So it's generated that the power station at 11,000 volts, 25,000 volts. But what do they do? You know, they increase this voltage to 400,000 volts. It's not, you know, it's a very high voltage. If you were to feel, and why do they do that? They do that so to keep the losses lower, if uh, the losses due to resistance lower. Okay, if you were to transmit this power at uh, 11,000 volts, you'd lose loss of electricity, loss of energy in the power lines. That's why they increased 400,000 volts. They discovered that uh, at the higher voltages, the losses are lower. Now, the problem is, are you going to feed 400,000 volts into your regular home? No, you're not going to do that because it's dangerous for, for us to handle that much voltage. So what do they do? What do we do? We use those transformers to decrease the voltage from 400,000 volts to 240 volts, 120 volts, depending, okay? As the transmission lines get closer to where the power will be used, the power is stepped down, right, okay? Lowering the voltage levels. And we're gonna cover how we do that. Generally power, this is done by transformers. Generally power lines near residential areas will be stepped down to a level of about 13,800 before using another transformer to drop the power again to 240 volts, okay? And that is in your book as well. That is illustrated in your book as well, okay? So here you go, here's the power station. In this power station, we, they are transmitting the, this energy, they, are, they generate this energy at 12,000 volts, 12 K volts. If you transmit at 12K volts, you're going to lose loss of energy through the power lines. So what do we do? They step up the voltage using a transformer. That's what we call a step up transformer. You know, they illustrated here 240,000 volts. It can be as high as 400,000 volts. And then you transmit this energy, higher voltage, lower losses. And then you start to step down the voltage from, for instance, 240,000 volts, first to eight, first step down to 8,000 volts before going to your house, and again at 240 volts. Step down transformer, substation, step down transformer to your house. Okay, that's uh, what we use transformers for. To step up the voltage and to step down the voltage. And we can prove that mathematically, how that is done. It's possible to prove that mathematically, okay? And we have we have transformers that the college... So, so, Professor, is the max voltage for a house or apartment 240? Yes, that's right. That's what, that was the standard that we use throughout the world. Here in Brazil, we use like either 120 or 240 volts. So what what if it comes what if it comes to like school or some bigger buildings? How will the transmitter know that it needs to give a higher voltage? Yeah, in school it's gonna be either two hundred forty or one hundred twenty volts. Okay, in schools, either one. And again, we use a transformer to to step down this voltage. Residences, schools. Okay, it's gonna be either one hundred twenty or two hundred forty. Okay, I believe the standard in the United States is 120. I do not know why they put 240 here. Well, what's the standard? But, but, but we can use both, both voltages, either at the residential level or other places. Make sense? 
check the, you know, let me see, if you go to your, here you go, let me get that. Here is a, the plug for my, is an adapter for my power, for my uh, note, notebook, okay? Every notebook has an adapter, right? That you connect to the electricity. If you go in your adapter, you're going to see here, AC adapter. That's the case of the adapter that I have here. And this one work, works anywhere between 100 to 240 volts. Okay, let me stop it here. You can take a look at your adapter. Uh, that's my adapter. And let's see if I can. If you look closely, uh, you cannot see very well, right? Uh, so there's those inscriptions. It tells you how the electricity is converted. Today, those adapters, are they usually work in a range of voltage, which is pretty good because you do not have to worry about the input voltage from your, from your wall, okay? But let's go back to the details of how a transformer works. The advantage of transformers is that they are very efficient energy converters, okay? You can see them in the power lines of the street where you live, of the street where you live. Okay, transformers are very simple devices, okay? You can, One type of transformer, one type of transformer uses two different solenoids that are, uh, how do you say? Two different solenoids which can be one of them be inside the other, one of them be inside the other, okay? So those devices that you saw right in here before, okay, here you go, see that? Can be considered a transformer, okay? The primary coil that has the energy at higher voltage, and the secondary coil that, that gets an induced current from the other one. And then, you know, here you have your resistor. You can have your appliance connected to the secondary coil. So this guy here can be considered a, a transformer, okay? Let's take a look at another another way of making transform. Let's see if your book has here. Okay. Here's a very nice illustration of another transformer. You can put you what you have here is a concentric transformer, right? With coils one inside the other. But there is a simpler way, there's a better way of uh, building a transformer as well. So you don't have to insert one coil inside the other is by, you know, using an iron core, okay? An iron core like this one here. And we have those there at the LA Harbor. The primary coil that comes from the electricity of the house, right? Or the, the electricity of the, of, the, of the power station is wrapped around this iron coil. And this, what, what's the role of this iron coil? The role of this iron coil is to concentrate the magnetic field of this 
coil here so it doesn't escape out the environment and guide the magnetic field to the other secondary coil. You see here, this one you have the generator and here you don't have a generator. And it, this is the secondary coil that's gonna power the appliances at your home. In this case, here's the TV, okay? This is the symbol of a transformer. One coil and another, the primary coil on the left, the secondary coil on the right, with the iron coil, with the, those two bars, right? Illustrating the iron core. Okay, so that's a very, that's a, that's a more practical way of inducing a current in a secondary coil. So you don't have to insert one coil inside the other. And it works very well. Why? What, what? What would happen if it did insert to each other? Well, the remember, right? Going back here to this situation, right? So you have the current flowing through this outer coil, right? Do you picture that, uh, Yorgo? Yes. And this current that changes in time induces a current in this other coil that is here, right? because it's inside the first coil. Yes. You can build, like I said, you can build a transformer like that, but, but to keep inserting one coil inside another one is very inconvenient, okay? So people discover another way of doing the same thing to get exactly the same effect by connecting one coil with another one by using a, a metal bar, uh, by using a nylon core. Okay, which is a metallic uh, device here that's connected one, one another. So what's happening? Now the magnetic field that is inside this, co this, this, this coil here is now propagating throughout this iron core. Okay, without the iron core, you already know that the magnetic field would be zero, right? But this iron core, what does it do? The function of this iron core is to ensure that the magnetic field does not become zero outside this, this coil here. That was the function of this iron core. And now it concentrates the magnetic field in this structure that's going to induce the magnetic field that's going to induce the electric current in the secondary coil. That's the, that's the function of the iron core. It's a very simple configuration. Very, very convenient too. Okay. And we can go back to our, uh, let's see. A very important device that are used in our daily lives. You can see them in the power line of the street where you live. Transformers are very simple devices. Here you go. One type of transformer uses two different solenoids that are two different concentric solenoids. Concentric solenoids. One inside the other. One inside the other, right? However, this configuration is not very convenient. So we use most, so most transformers use a, a nylon core to concentrate the magnetic field. Uh, we use both, we use an, uh, a nylon core inserted, right? Inserted in the primary and secondary coils, okay? Like that. This iron core, the role of this iron core, right? The role of this iron core is to concentrate the magnetic field 
of the primary coil. So it can induce the current in the second secondary coil more easily, uh, more easily. That's what. Okay. Let me see if I have a picture of a transformer. Uh, transformer demonstration, right? YouTube has lots of those transformer demonstration. Let's see if this one is a good one. Hey, Jira. We brought you here to skip. Oh, yeah, here you go. Now, what I have here. Do you see here? We have two coils, two solenoids. One of them is connected to a power source. The other one isn't. Okay, and do you see the coil here? The, the coil, no, the iron core. The iron core is inserted into one core and connected to the iron core that's also inserted in the other core. You know, that's a real life type of device. Let's see what she's going to tell us. Three minutes only. Now, what I have here is a transformer. I'm going to take it to pieces so that you can see the parts that make it up. So, starting here, I've got a bunch of metal strips, in fact, U-shaped metal strips all stuck together. These are called laminations, and they are there, in fact, to prevent heating. But they're formed into the shape of a U, and then later I will put this one on top, so that together they're going to form what we call an iron core. And the magnetic field in fact, gets contained within this. Okay, the magnetic field gets contained into this structure. That's the advantage of using the iron core. Without the iron core, the magnetic field is not contained on the outside. Remember, the magnetic field of a solenoid outside the solenoid is zero, right? So we could not use this device as a transformer if those two coils were separate like that side by side because the magnetic field here outside is going to be zero and it's not going to induce any current whatsoever in the secondary coil, right? One way to do that would be to insert this coil into this other coil. But like I said, it's not convenient to do that. So people figure out a way of doing the same thing by using this iron core. This iron core. So if I have any kind of current and there's magnetic field produced on one side. Normally, magnetic field, say, produced by a bar magnet, the field lines come up and around in the air. But it would be, well, you could say that it would rather be travelling through the iron. So magnetic field lines created on this side will come up and around and down, forming a complete circle. And same with any field lines created on this side. So let's put it together. I have two coils and they have a different number of turns. And I'm not going to tell you how many turns each has. It seems to me that the primary coil is this one on the left. That's what seems to me. She, she still didn't show, she, she still didn't tell us where the generator is located, okay? But what you see right in here is, the, is your voltmeter, right? The voltmeter for the for this coil, the voltmeter for this other coil. So it seems, it looks like, do you see the, this device here on the back? It looks like that's the generator. Okay, it looks like this one is the generator, which is connected, which seems to be connected to this, to this transformer here. Let's see what she's gonna say. Because what I want you to do is calculate the ratio of the turns. That's all you can get from these two voltages. So attached to this one yeah. is my power supply. Yeah, see that? So that's the primary, definitely. And that's the power supply or the generator. So that makes this coil the primary coil, and this is the secondary coil. So this secondary isn't connected to any power supply at all. 
it's simply connected to this voltmeter and the voltage on the primary is measured with this voltmeter. And I should mention that, of course, we need AC electricity to make this work because you need the changing magnetic field to make a current. And so these little meters here are in fact able to show AC voltages as well as DC. So they'll give a reading. Not all analog meters are able to read AC, but these ones can. So I'll just put on Go the ahead. power. So I have here some voltage in my primary. And we'll give you close-up photos because you're going to be measuring the voltage on the primary and the secondary. So just to point out that this meter is set to 10 volts maximum uh, voltage. And this one is set to read a maximum of 30 volts. And so what I want you to do is to use those two voltages to calculate what is the ratio of the number of turns in the secondary over the number of turns in the primary. Okay. Hey, Grant Cardone here. So four decades. Let's take a look at this other another video here. Transformer experiments and demos. Let's take a look at this one here. Okay, here you go. Here's a transformer, and here's the iron core. Okay. Transformers. Do you see the transformer here? Right? The iron core? Let's see what he's going to tell us. These are everywhere, inside and outside of your home. They're in TV sets, sound systems, computers, and almost every electronic device. This thing is a very familiar transformer that is often used to provide lower voltages to electrical devices. So everybody has a transformer there at home, okay? This AC adapter, the same one that I showed you that I have here, is a transformer. And this guy is showing also a transformer for you. That cannot connect directly. It happens that you cannot see inside because this whole device is, clo is, is, is closed, right? But uh, inside it looks just like those two coils that you saw. Iron. Professor, I have a good question. Yeah. So the transformers, they they put a limit, right, on how much electricity it sucks in to give, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So if if you know how to take the cover out, and I guess play with it, can you make it where the limiter of the transformer is out, like it's not two forty no more? It'll be more. Oh yeah, yeah. The, I'm gonna cover that. It depends all all on the number of turns in the coil. Okay. So if you can, if you change the number of turns in the coil, you can you can change also the output, the 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 voltage that the secondary coil, for instance, receives. Okay. So that 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 how. That one way. That one way of. Uh, addressing this that that's very smart because i usually see i see in stores usually the the cheaper uh voltages the cheaper watts they're cheaper the more expensive ones like 70 80 90 they're more expensive so if you know how to do it you can just buy a cheap one i guess play with it yeah yeah they have have you done that to be honest with you, never, because uh, I, I got afraid if I'm going to get shocked or not. Oh, Can you get shocked from him? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, uh, you, th th there might be some, you know, some uh, kits out there that you can play with. Uh, you might not be able to change the number of turns of them, on them, but, but I'm quite sure you can. Let's take a look here. Transformer kits, right? Uh, transformer kits, uh, model kit, transformer model kits. 
No, <laughs> that's, that's not the transformer you want, right? Uh, I want an electrical transformer. Uh, you know, electrical transformer. Transformer electric model. Let's see. Electrical model. Power transformer. Install. Uh, so see this one here. Explore. Let's see here. Now those are very large. I just want some educational transformers. Teaching electrical model of power transformer. Let's take a look at this one. Okay, okay. That's a that's a paper. Okay, this is a paper here. Is it is it illegal to buy one? Illegal? No, it's not illegal. They sell that. They sell those things. You know, here you go another transformer model here. Transformer. Okay, Wikipedia has. Here you go. See? Oh, see the coil, the coil, the iron coil here. Yes. One coil, another coil. Those things are not. No, they're not illegal. It's so much that you have. Uh, you, we we buy those things with our computers, right? Now. Uh, Yeah, or the so, more the more coil it circles, the more voltage is higher. Well, we, we're going to get there. We, we, I, I don't want to spoil it yet. <laughs> we can calculate that using, that using Faraday's law. Okay, and you are going to see very soon how 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 it, it depends. Okay, on the ratio of the turns that you have right in here, and we we are going to calculate that. But but let's take a look at this video, right? There you go. I like this one because it's the guy is showing us a transformer. Also familiar are the transformers that look like trash cans high up on top of the hills. There's probably one near your school or neighborhood. These transformers are used to step down the voltage and correspondingly up the current to make it safer in the home. Understanding transformers involves knowing that currents can produce magnetic fields, and conversely, that changing magnetic fields can also generate currents. When I pass current through this coil, the compass will deflect. It's an electromagnet. Now we perform the reverse experiment. When I move this magnet through the coil, the galvanometer indicates that a current is flowing. Notice that when I hold the magnet still, no current is produced. The magnetic field must change in order to produce an electric field that motivates the charges. Note also the direction I move the magnet makes the Okay, uh, I want to go forward here because he's repeating things that we already seen. Turns okay. on an ideal here. work. Incorrectly using DC for the input of the transformer, like say a battery, might even damage it. Okay, now here you go. That's where the, the whole transformer thing starts, right? One is the primary, the other one is the secondary. This is the secondary. Why do I know this is the secondary? Because the primary is connected to this box, the generator. Okay, and the secondary is not is connected only to the to, to multimeter here. The number of turns on an ideal transformer is in proportion to the voltage across those turns. Here, I have turns in an 8 to 1 ratio, and the voltage of 3 volts for my signal generator is stepped up by that same ratio. Did you get that? You have 200 turns here. You have 1,600 turns here. This guy here has a voltage, a peak voltage, of 3 volts only, but because the the ratio is 8, 16 divided by 2, right? 1,600 divided by 200 is 8. We end up stepping up the voltage in this coil here. From 3, it goes to 24. And we can prove that mathematically. Again, note, see here, our iron core, right? That's used to concentrate the magnetic field along this direction. It should be three volts to 24 volts, but this is not- a Ah, it's just supposed to be 24 volts, right? But it's not 24 volts. Why is that? There's a reason for that. The reason because this is not an ideal transformer. There are some losses along the way. 
Okay. Not an ideal transformer, and there are some losses, mostly due to flux leakage. Okay. We need transformers because it's more efficient to send electricity at higher voltages. This is the symbol for a transformer, but here it's connected in an Okay, we can stop here. I like this video. I'm going to provide you with a link to this video in my notes, but you have to go to the proper place, right? Uh, videos on transformers. This one here. And there is that of, of the female professor, right? This one here too. Ever wonder why so many people say they want to learn guitar, but very few actually learn to play? It's right here. Now, what I have here is a trans. Another one. Okay, transform very important devices that are used in our daily lives. You can see them in the power lines of the street where you live. Transformers are very simple devices. One type of transform uses two different concentric solenoids, one inside the other. However, this configuration is not very convenient, so most transformers use a nylon core connecting, right? Here you go. The primary coil to the secondary coil. The role of this iron core is to concentrate the magnetic field of the primary coil so it can induce the current in the secondary coil more easily. Okay, now let's go for the uh, with transformers. With, with transformers, we can either step up or step down the AC voltage in our AC circuit, okay? This is done by using different numbers of turns in each coil, okay? Like that. So say, say you have, uh, you have a 1000 volts AC in a circuit and you want to step to, you want to use a lower voltage, say 120 volts AC. Okay. What do you have? You have, you can do that. You can lower the voltage by using a transformer where the primary coil has more turns than the secondary coil. And the equation goes like that. Here you go. The induced voltage in the primary coil, right? This is just Faraday's law. is equal to the number of turns in the primary coil times the magnetic flux in the, the change of magnetic flux in time in the primary coil. And then we have the similar equation for the secondary coil. In transformers, right? In transformers, uh, the area of the secondary, of the primary, of the primary and secondary coils are usually the same, okay? It's usually the same.
for this reason, since the magnetic field is also the same, right? Since the magnetic field is also the same, we have the following relation. The change in the magnetic flux in the primary coil with time is the same as the change of magnetic flux in the secondary coil. Okay. And now that we have this equality, okay, we just go back to these two equations and he write uh, the magnetic flux, oh, the magnetic flux. Like that. Okay. Using the other equation, right? That should be the primary here. That should be the secondary here. Secondary. Secondary. Right? So substitute that here. Substitute that here. Right? Substituting the last two relations in the first one, we have a gap. This one goes here, and this other one goes here we cancel the negative signs, right? And now what do we have? I'm going to rewrite, rewrite this relation as the following. The ratio in the voltages is equal to the ratio of turns, okay? So let's see. Let's analyze those equations carefully. Right? If, if NP is greater than NS, right? If this one is greater, this one is going to be greater than one, right? Consequently, the voltage in the primary is going to be greater than one as well. See that? So here you go. I'm going to put that if NP greater than, uh, let's, let's put, uh, I'm going to do like that. If NP greater than NS, right? What does it mean? It means that this ratio is greater than one, right? This guy, this ratio here is going to be greater than one. Since this ratio must be equal to this ratio, this imply that this ratio is also greater than one, right? So voltage of the primary is gonna be greater than the voltage in the secondary. So in this case, we have, uh, in this case, we have a step down transformer. We can even put, we can even use the numeric examples as well. We're gonna use a numeric example very, very soon. No. Now the other example, if, right? I'm gonna put it here like that. I'm gonna copy this one. Two, here you go. If NP less than NS, right? 
So VP is going to be less than VS. And we have a step up transformer. Step up transformer. Let's do numeric examples. Numerical examples. Numerical examples. Okay, we, you know, VP is equal. 240,000 volts, right? And NP is what? 1600 turns. And that's 200 turns. Find VS. Find VS. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, we use this relationship right in here. Solution. VP and P is 1,600 divided by 1,200, right? Is going to be eight. It's gonna be eight. Now we have this ratio here. VP over VS is eight. We want to find VS. VS is going to be VP divided by eight. VP was 2,400 volts. Divided. Yes, it's going to be 2,400 divided by 8, which is going to be what? 300? 3,000, right? No, no, 30,000 volts. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 30,000. What time is that? It's 11.27. Let's take our break now. Okay, so we are done. We are done this chapter. We're done with chapter 22. And now when we are back, we start with chapter 23. Everything here is done. Uh, break, That's, any, any questions about that? Ideally, no, it would be not just uh, being, not just lecture on this material, but also doing experiments. That would be the ideal situation. Playing with transformers, just like uh, Yurgo was mentioning, right? Getting the transformers inside their iron core, separate the transformers, putting the transformer outside the iron core so you can see that there is no induced current in the other one, right? That would be the ideal situation. And the break, uh, 11.30 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. Huh? Let's do a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Let's do I So I see you in 15 minutes. There was one more thing that I should have. To, uh, we're not doing chapter 22 yet. That is, uh, 
just one more thing that we should talk about. It's uh, how to find out the current, okay? In the secondary circuit. Okay, that's the only thing that's missing here. And it's uh, a little bit more different, slightly different than what we did for the voltage, okay? Indicate of the current, the indicate of the current, in the case of, the, of current, the process is a little bit different. It's a little bit different and it involves the power of the circuit. So recall that, you know, P, the power in a circuit is V times the current, VI, okay? So in order, in order, to have uh, conservation of energy, of energy, right? We must have that the power in the primary must be equal to the power in the secondary, or, you know, we don't even have to put P here. We can just put this way, hey, oh, or the V in the primary times the current in the primary must be equal to the V, the voltage in the secondary and the current in the secondary. When we use the ratios, right? We can, we already know what this one is, right? This one is equal to that that we got from Faraday's law, okay? And look what we have. We have that uh, the current decreases as the voltage increases, right? It's an inverse proportion. V, the, v of P is inversely proportional to the current in the primary. So if the voltage increases, the current is going to decrease. Okay? That's what we have for this for this chapter. Now we are done with it. What we have to do is uh, get into chapter 23. We have 10 more minutes only to do it. AC circuits. AC circuits. Okay. Two types of circuit. I have already hammered on that before, right? I'm gonna hammer it on this on that again. DC circuits and AC circuits. DC circuits current flows in a single direction. The power source is the battery. In AC circuit, current flows in both directions. The power source is a generator. Okay, we can come up with this little table here. Huh. Direction of the current, one direction is either clockwise or counterclockwise. AC is goes both directions. The power source is the battery. Power source is the generator. Power source behave voltage is constant. Voltage varies sinusoidally. There are all sorts of AC circuits. Okay. The simplest one is AC circuit with the resistor only. And then we can have an AC circuit with a capacitor only. 
with an inductor only, which is the solenoid, and then we have a combination, a combination of the above. And the combination can be RC, RL, CL, and RCL. Okay? The symbols of the all is this one here. That's the symbols of all circuits that we have. Symbols of AC circuits that we have. The other ones that are a little bit more complicated, they behave in a slightly different way. But let's start uh, with AC circuit with a resistor. And we can see that. Okay, AC circuit is a resistor. We have simulations at that place there, the fat. Let's take a look there. Okay, this one right in here. And DC, DC, AC, right in here. Okay, let's start with this one here. Uh, what's going on here? Oh, here you go. That's the one. AC voltage. Here you go. Let's take a look at the power source. Where is the power source? Oh, yeah. Here you go. That's the one. Right? Here you go. The wire. We're going to connect the wires. I'm going to put a switch in the circuit. And the samples of all circuits is the one, AC circuit is the one with a resistor. And I'm going to put the resistor right in here. I can change the frequency of my generator, see that? And I can change the voltage as well. Okay, frequency. And then we have a, we have devices here. We can either use the voltmeter, ammeter, or this one here, which are oscilloscopes, by the way. Oscilloscope, the voltmeter and the ammeter, they they do not, they cannot measure a voltage or current that's changing as time goes by. Okay, so here I'm gonna close the circuit. Okay, do you see the charges oscillating back and forth? That's exactly what happens in real life. Okay, going through the resistor. If we increase uh, the frequency, here you go, it oscillates. Faster, right? If I decrease the frequency, it oscillates, the charges oscillates is lower. I can increase the voltage too. Okay. The oscillation of the charges is, is larger, right? Let, let's compare, here it goes. Here is zero volts. There is no oscillation whatsoever. The charges don't move at all. Voltage is zero. But what about here? Here you go. The charges at 18 volts, they travel a shorter distance. Right? But here, the charge at 120 volts, they travel a longer distance. The amplitude of oscillation is greater. That's a simple circuit that we have out there. Okay, so let's 
frequency, let's put this one here. And then if we put a voltmeter right here, our regular voltmeter, look what we get. We see it oscillating back and forth. If we increase the voltage, you know, it, it doesn't stay at a single value, right? If we increase the frequency, you just, you can hardly read the number here. So we do not use this type of device to follow the voltage, to measure the voltage in an AC circuit. Instead, we use this type of device that you see right here that, uh, that we call the oscilloscope. I'm going to connect at this point, I'm going to connect at this point, okay? And we see the trace that we have. Let's see if I can adjust. Right now, the amplitude of the voltage is too high for the oscilloscope to measure. It's uh, blowing up. Let's see, we can go lower. Uh, oh, yeah, here you go. See that? We have actual devices like that, like the oscilloscope to measure the variation of voltage and the current. Okay. If I increase, if I decrease the frequency, you go, look what happens to the frequency of the voltage, right? The period increases, the period here of the oscilloscope increases. So that's voltage in the y-axis and time in the x-axis. Okay. So what you have to know, uh, I, I see circuit with a resistor, right? So don't forget that my, two more minutes to go. My generator has this type of behavior. It's a voltage, peak voltage sine of two pi f, f is the frequency times t. Two pi f, we call it angular frequency, omega. Okay, so we go. F is the frequency of the circuit, number of oscillation per unit of time, omega is the angular frequency. Now we can have a relation between the voltage and the current by using Ohm's law. Okay. So using Ohm's using Ohm's law, we have that V equal to Ri. Okay, that's given. R is the resistor of your circuit, I is the current. And we can solve this relation here for the current alone. And you can see that uh, the current is directly proportional to sine 2 pi ft, and the voltage is also proportional to pi ft. We say, in this, under this circumstance, we say that both the voltage and current are in phase, okay? They're both in phase. Eleven fifty nine. Uh, something that doesn't happen. Something that does not happen to the does not happen when we insert a an inductor or capacitor in the place of the resistor okay watch out for that so resistor capacitors and inductors they behave differently in a ac circuit and we can stop now do you have any questions it's 12 noon right now. And if you don't have any questions, we're going to have uh, office hours right now. I'll be here and I'll see you on Wednesday when we have our exam. Okay? So see you then.